Hello, my name is Bruce Simpson. This is my submission on the FAA's NPRM for the implementation of remote ID on unmanned aircraft. And first of all, a little bit about myself. I'm what's commonly called an influencer. I have two very successful YouTube channels that deal with radio controlled model aircraft and recreationally flown multi-rotor drones. Between them, those two channels have had a total of 120 million video views and they have accumulated a combined total of almost 400,000 subscribers. So a lot of people take note of what I say, they watch my videos, and I get a lot of feedback from this community telling me what they think, what they want, and, and what, they, what they're doing. So I have a pretty good finger on the pulse of this community, and it's a community that's going to be very much affected by this NPRM. So I have received a lot of feedback, and I want to condense that into this video to present to you. So I'm speaking for myself and also for many thousands of other people who have effectively given me license to speak on their behalf. Now, another point you should be aware of is that I'm the guy who, way back 18 years ago, built his own cruise missile in a rural garage here in New Zealand. And the reason I did that was because I could already see the risks on the horizon. I could see that already, back in 2002, drone technology was in the hands of anyone that wanted it. And bad actors could do bad things with that technology if they chose to do so. So I built a proof of concept craft. It was covered by the media around the world and certainly um, US federal agencies took note of what I was doing and there was a lot of feedback from them as well. So yeah, I was 18 years ahead of the game because now the FAA is using this security aspect as justification for uh, the new NPRM. Now what I want to talk about is this whole issue of safety and security and I think your NPRM is an excellent piece of work. You're to be commended on it. Some of the ideas are brilliant. I think it's fantastic. But I think its scope is a little flawed, and I'll tell you why. Uh, this NPRM is supposed to apply to all unmanned aircraft systems, regardless of their risk profile, and regardless of the effect it's going to have on established uses and users. And that is where the problem arises. Now, I am a model aircraft flyer from many years back. I've been flying model aircraft for 55 years, which is a very long time. And I have come up through the ranks and I've built my own models and now I build and fly recreational multi-rotor drones for, for racing and freestyling and in and, and that entire period of time. I've never damaged anyone's property or injured anybody. So it is a pretty safe recreational pastime. And what concerns me is that the, a, the FAA hasn't looked at who should be affected by this NPRM and who shouldn't. So I'm going to do that for you in this video. Now, first of all, who should this NPRM apply to? Well, certainly the commercial operators, the, the UPS, the DHL, the Amazon, the Google Wing, all these companies that want to set up commercial drone services, this NPRM, NPRM should apply to them because they're going to be using high-risk craft in built-up areas to deliver products, allegedly. Uh, so you need to have very good control over them. You need to know where they are, what they're doing, and you need to have a great level of accountability from these commercial operators. And the risks associated with their operations are significantly higher than when some young lad flies a 300-gram foam model plane in a park somewhere. So. Certainly, the commercial operators, this NPRM is ideal for them and the risk profile they represent. Now, the second group who perhaps this NPRM should apply to are the people who go and buy a store-bought camera drone. This is typically like your, your DJI product, which has GPS and it has an onboard camera. And a lot of these people, not all of them, but a lot of them are, are not particularly aware of the rules and not particularly aware of their responsibilities or safe operating procedure. Now, having said that, the vast majority of these people do operate responsibly and safely. There's only a tiny, tiny number that have created some of the incidents that we read about. So, but the NPRM as proposed will not affect these people very much. They will buy their store-bought drone, it will have the built-in remote ID system, and it will work as you prescribe it to work. So they will be largely unaffected. They will still be able to fly where they've flown before and, and you'll know where they are in the airspace, that's fine. I want to talk on behalf of the community that is the lowest risk, but the most impacted by this NPRM. And that are the people like myself and the thousands of people, I, hundreds of thousands of people I represent. The people who, for, this, for them, this is a passion, it is a hobby. They don't just buy 
drones off the shelf. They build their own craft. They build their own racing drones, or they build their own freestyle aerobatic drones, or they build model aircraft. They build scale models of Spitfires and P-51s and, and Cessnas and other aircraft. And they build sport aircraft. They fly gliders, thermal soaring gliders, and hand launch gliders. And, and the, the, the range of craft that they build and fly is enormous. Obviously far greater than the FAA realized, because recently you acknowledged that you didn't know this was going on. Uh, so here you go. I'm representing these people, because these people are basically having their hobby taken from them under this NPRM. Yes, under the proposed rules, the only place these people will be able to fly their non-remote ID compliant craft is at a freer. And a freer, as you're aware, because you're reading the submission, you're in the FAA, a freer is an, is an area set aside for the flying of these non-compliant craft. And during the first 12 months of the, end, of the rules coming into effect, the FAA will work with community-based organizations to identify and designate freers, where people can go with their non-compliant craft and fly. The problem with this is that a great many of the people I represent do not wish to fly their very low risk models over an empty field in the middle of nowhere. I fly freestyle multi-rotor drones. I like to fly through trees. I like to fly through abandoned buildings. I like to fly, all this is very close to the ground, often below the tree cover, below the height of nearby buildings and obstructions that would prevent manned aviation from entering that airspace. And this is being done at virtually no risk. The risk is very low. There have been, let me just point this out, Important fact I'm going to bring you now, no person has ever been killed as a result of the recreational use of multi-rotor drones in the entire history of the hobby. You should make a note of that. So I represent these people and we don't want to be confined to a grassy field in the middle of nowhere. Likewise, for example, I go to schools locally and I take my model aircraft and my, my drones with me. Now, they weigh more than 250 grams, so they're not exempt from the proposed freer. But it means I cannot demonstrate a 300 gram model aircraft to a class full of school children, because in the USA, that would be a breach of the NPRM. The, unless their school grounds are defined as a freer, which is most unlikely, to fly a model aircraft to demonstrate to children, to give them a passion for aviation, would be an offense. It'd be a breach of the rules. That's, that's ridiculous. That's crazy. How are we going to interest new generations of children in aviation if we cannot start them on the first rung of that ladder? Because to demonstrate the technology would be a crime. Now, you talk about safety, and I must point out to you that I have not seen an independently peer-reviewed risk assessment for the group I represent, the people who build their own recreational multi-rotor drones and their own model aircraft. I've seen no risk assessment from the FAA that in any way proves that they are a risk to the public safety or the national security. In fact, all the evidence I've seen points to exactly the opposite. And where do, where do I get my evidence? Well, in lieu of a independent peer-reviewed risk assessment from the FAA, I look to the best risk assessors in the world, the insurance industry. The insurance industry's very existence relies on accurate risk assessment. Um, and if you look at what I can do, if you live in America, you can go out tomorrow and you can get tens of millions of dollars of insurance coverage for your flying, your recreational multi-rotor drone or your model aircraft. You can get tens of millions of dollars of coverage for a few tens of dollars a year. And what does that tell you? That tells you that the insurance companies, the companies who rely on getting it right for their existence, say it's a very low risk activity, very low risk indeed. They've got all the historical data, they've got the claim data, they've done the research, they're analyzing the figures on an almost daily basis, and they're saying, it's safe. It's so safe, we'll give you tens of millions of dollars of coverage for a few measly bucks a year. And that seems to fly in the face of the FAA's assertion that this group should be included in the coverage of the NPRM. And let's go further, let's, let's just look at the whole drone uh, risk as, as a whole thing. Now, if we go to the George Mason University, they did a study where they took bird strike data and they extrapolated out trends and so forth to determine just what risk a drone would pose to a manned aircraft in the national airspace. And they came to the conclusion that the risk is virtually zero for quite a number of reasons. The main one being that the airspace is a very big place and the number of drone flights, the number of manned aviation flights, the risks of these things colliding randomly is incredibly low. There's also other elements such as birds flock, drones don't. 
And so bird strike is a far more risky operation than a drone flying. So the, the facts, the science points to the fact that, that drones are not a risk, the risk that you claim they are. And the insurance data's comprehensive risk analysis, which is constantly being reviewed, also says recreational use of, rec of multi-rotor drones and model aircraft is not a risk in the way you claim it is. So I, I beg the FAA to go back and reanalyze their situation in respect to people like myself who build and fly their own craft. We are not a risk at all. In fact, if you look at the history, the model aircraft hobby has had barely a handful of deaths in its entirety, its entire existence. It's been around for over a century. People have been flying model aircraft and the number of deaths, you could count them on the fingers of one hand. That makes it one of or the safest aspect of aviation bar none. No other form of aviation is as safe as model aircraft, the flying of model aircraft. So it makes no sense to impose restrictions and remove freedoms that you're not imposing or removing elsewhere. Let me use as an example general aviation. This MPRM would require all model aircraft to either fly to freer or to have remote ID built into them, even when flying in Class G airspace. So you're telling me that a 300 gram model needs to have what is effectively a transponder to tell other aircraft where it is. Yet a manned aircraft, much bigger, far more dangerous, these are the things people die in, and far more of a risk to other parties, um, it doesn't need an ADS-B transponder if it's flying in Class G. It doesn't even need a radio by law. So why is a model being burdened with these technological requirements? As I say, it makes no sense. Um, we need to look at the real risks. You need to look at the real risks because you are trying to remove people's freedoms, freedoms they've enjoyed safely for a very long time. And yes, sometimes freedoms need to be removed, but only when it is just to do so. And to, to be just, you've got to have justification. And the FAA has presented no evidence, no science, no historical data to show that all of a sudden, after many decades of safe operation, people flying model aircraft, home-built radio-controlled craft, are suddenly a threat to the safety or security of the nation. Now, you may argue that people buying these store-bought drones, they represent a risk. That's fine. Uh, include them in your NPRM, but exclude the traditional hobby, the people who build their own craft and fly their own craft and repair their own craft and often design their own craft. They are the passionate hobbyists. They are not the problem. Don't make them the problem by forcing them to give up their hobby or, which is far more likely, to fly outside of the rules because then you have no control. And I know right now you're probably thinking, well, it, it, let's sacrifice the hobby to preserve safety. Well, for a start, I think for the FAA to kill this hobby, which is what they are planning to do, would be a huge blow to the US economy and its technological dominance in the fields of aviation and aerospace. And I can prove this too. Let's go back. Let's go right back to the beginning of aviation. Wilbur and Orville Wright built the Wright Flyer and were the first men in the world to engage in manned aviation with a controlled heavier than aircraft. They weren't aviation engineers. They, they, they built bicycles for a job. Their job was building and repairing bicycles. But they started flying model aircraft. They developed a passion for aviation. That passion translated into putting the USA on the map when it comes to aviation, the first country in the world to fly. That's it. That passion of aviation produced a world first. Let's move forward quite a number of years. When Neil Armstrong put his boot on the moon, he was the first person in the world to walk on the moon and he put America's flag on the moon. Where did Neil Armstrong develop his passion for flying and for space. Yeah, yeah. He was a model aircraft enthusiast. He designed and built his own models and flew them in local parks when he was a kid. And that went on to a career in aviation and then into aerospace and then to hold the, the prize of being the first man in the world to step on the moon. Now imagine if the hobby had been deemed to be illegal as the FAA is proposing now under this NPRM. Imagine if these people couldn't design their own models. Imagine if they couldn't fly in parks and accessible areas without endangering the public. The Wright brothers would never have built the Wright Flyer and some other country would have taken the prize for the first country to fly. America would not have been first to the moon. Russia would probably be the ones whose flag is flying on the moon now because Neil Armstrong would never have developed the passion for aviation that he did through his engagement in the hobby and the freedom to build his own models, design his own models and fly them in the local park as and when he wanted to. So this is the, what you risk. This is what the FAA and the US government risks by outlawing 
an incredibly safe hobby, a hobby that you, in which you can buy tens of millions of dollars of insurance for a few bucks a year, you're going to ankle tap the dominance that the USA currently enjoys. Where, if you go to Boeing, if you go to NASA, if you go to McDonnell Douglas and you talk to their aerospace engineers, I am betting you good money that a large number of those engineers will be where they are because they started playing with model aircraft. It's a hobby that instills a passion for aviation in so many people. And it's an affordable, accessible hobby at the moment. So even the youngest child can start getting involved in model aircraft. And then the, the passion burns in them and they take, on, take it on as a career in aviation, aerospace. That's where you get your technology from. If you kill the hobby by applying this NPRM to people who design, build and fly and maintain their own model aircraft and recreational multi-rotor drones, you are condemning the USA to become a consumer of technology. Not an innovator, not a leader, not a producer, but a consumer of technology. Because other countries will eclipse you. They will still have the young people who are exposed to model aviation and get passionate and turn that interest into a career and come up with the innovations and the developments that make aviation better, faster, safer. The USA will be buying its airliners from China and buying its other technologies from India and Indonesia, where there are countries that don't consider model aviation to be a crime, as the FAA is about to make it. So that's my presentation to you. That is my submission. I speak on behalf of many, many thousands of people, all of who enjoy building their own craft and flying them, and all of who will effectively have their hobby taken from them under this NPRM because they will no longer be able to build their own craft because there'll be nowhere to fly them and all the freers are gone. And even if you decide to regularly renew the list of freers, it's not going to help the kid in a town who doesn't have transport to get to one of those designated areas, who can quite safely fly his small foam plane that he's built himself in the local park as generations of Americans have done for decades. So there you go. I hope you'll take that on board. If you've got any questions, if you want to speak to me, a dialogue, I'm always available. Um, you've had my details through the submission form. I'm happy to speak to you on behalf of the many hundreds of thousands of people that I represent. But please do not, do not throw us under a bus because you haven't taken the time to properly evaluate the risk in the way that the insurance company and the universities have. Thank you for watching. My name is Bruce Simpson. That's my submission.